So I joined the Marines in December 2000. I must have been 10 and a half stone, piss sweat through, surrounded by all these men of all ages from all walks of life. The only job I've had before this was a paper round. And I just remember arriving there, seeing these Marines, these trade ranks, like, wow, these are like machines. And everyone seemed fitter, seemed stronger. Obviously, I've just come straight from school, fully out of my comfort zone in this brand new world. They try to instill in you a set of values, morals and standards expected of a Marine, all in order to, say, achieve that Green Beret. And I received the Determination Award, which I'd say to this day is still probably is one of my most proudest achievements because maybe I wasn't the fittest, the strongest or even the best in the field, but I was valued the most determined and I was the youngest recruit, so it was really something to be proud of. I was then drafted to 4-5 Commando based in Scotland. I was actually still only 17. And 2002, not long after 9-11, 4-5 Commando deployed to Afghanistan. I was 17, I'd have to stay behind. So it was a frustrating time. I've then deployed on three operational tours after that, two tours of Iraq and a tour of Northern Ireland. So after 4-5 Commando, I've then drafted down to a unit called 148 Battery based down in Poole, became part of a six-man fire support team. And then I would deploy to Afghanistan in 2006 on Herrick 5. First time under fire, basically an ambush. Now, your training prepares you for moments like this. But I always say nothing fully compares to when rounds are hitting so close in and around your head that one wrong move and you could be gone. So the first time we came under fire, an RPG exploded behind us, followed by an array of small arms fire. Myself and the guy, we were pinned down. We could hardly move. Fear kicks in, adrenaline kicks in but then the mindset of your training takes over and you react and you respond in a way you've been trained to do in order to overcome that challenge and defeat the enemy. Coming back from Afghanistan at first, it was hard because you spent six months basically fighting an enemy and your life is on the line every day. You're trusting people beside you with your life, death, destruction all around you. Then all of a sudden you come back home and you're back to normality, back to reality. It's hard to adjust at first from that military mindset where you're hyper alert every day, hyper vigilant to try and to relax. The adrenaline and the highs that have taken place for so many months, when you come back, everything can seem sometimes maybe a little flat. So you try and sometimes replace the adrenaline or the highs in, in other ways. For me personally, when I came back, I bought a motorbike an R6. I could hardly ride it. I come off the road about three times, <laughs> but it was the adrenaline and the highs and it was the rush I think I was chasing more than the actual the bike. So not long after Afghanistan, I was at a crossroads. Do I get super keen like some of the lads did and go through the special forces route? Or do I leave and pursue a career in close protection? I was still only 24 at this point and I chose to leave and pursue the career in close protection. I thought I'd been in the Marines since I was 16. I had a girlfriend at the time that helped influence my decision to leave. So at 24, got my close protection courses under my belt and then I left. When I first started Close Protection, originally I was working in and around London on some red carpet events, networking, just trying to basically get my name out there, meet the right people, get more work. Um, it was difficult to start with at first. I've then spent some time in Iraq on a hostile Close Protection contract. Basically it felt kind of similar because you're still with some of the lads you know, all from similar backgrounds. You're doing a similar kind of detail, but the risk didn't feel nowhere near as high as day-to-day -day life in Afghanistan, as it didn't feel as dangerous. Even though it was dangerous what we were doing, we were there kind of as a protection thing. We weren't there looking for a fight. So I remember when I arrived on my first job with the super rich and the super famous on a super yacht in the St. Bart's, and it was just mind blowing. This whole new world of the super rich, the elite, how the other half literally live was just mesmerizing. It was incredible. It was a window into a whole new world. I think the best thing about working in that kind of exclusive world, totally alien to anything I'd experienced before from the Afghanistan or working in Iraq and all the hostile, the, the gritty, the dirtiness to now bear in mind this young kid from Sunderland that's progressed through the military, now trusted to protect the, the global elite, if you like, or these super famous people was really something to be proud of that you'd actually managed to find your, your way in these circles with these people. So I actually remember my first summer in the south of France with Elton John. You lived this glamorous, luxurious, mesmerizing life for six weeks with these superstars. Then all of a sudden you fly back home and I just remember sitting in my apartment on my own 
in Manchester, it's raining outside. Like, wow, I've just experienced that life, how the other half lived for six weeks. And I'm now back to the real world, straight back to reality. <laughs> my life felt so boring. I've then reached what I like to think of as the pinnacle of my close protection years. And I was tasked full time to look after a countess based out of the Bahamas as her personal bodyguard. We'd fly around the world on private jets, visit a private island. I'd take the kids on shopping trips to Miami for the weekend. We'd eat together, shop together, we'd even train together. So my time in the Bahamas was amazing. Now that all came to an end through one of many bad decisions. And I now made a decision with my heart and not my head. I've decided to leave my client and take a summer break and go to Ibiza. I spent four months there. We've got there, we've landed. Everything's going amazing to start with. I've moved in with two tour managers of two of the island's most popular DJs. So now I had an exclusive world into the party scene, but everything that came with it. So then as the season went on, I started to take drugs. Now, on the outside, it looked like I was having an amazing time. But on the inside, I was filled with shame, with regret. And I knew the decision I made to end up here was wrong. But the more I had them feelings, the more I was taking drugs to try and shut them out. So as the season went on, we was partying, I was taking more drugs. I was digging myself into a hole that was just getting deeper and deeper. And I was swept along with the whole party lifestyle. Right, Ibiza has a dark side. Now, at the end of the summer, our apartment was burgled. As we've come back from one of the after parties, we've opened the door, our whole apartment had been ransacked. Now, I had everything from my time in close protection taken. Well, I've needed to borrow money to get back home. When I've come back from Ibiza, I've come back skint, broken, with a bad habit. I've been asked to do a driving job, which I've agreed it was a one-off thing. The money from this job would pay the, back the money that I borrowed. But at this point, my mindset was so far removed from what it once was. My thinking, my perception, everything was still off. So I was making now one bad decision after another. Taking drugs impacted me in a big way because it altered my whole perception on everything. My thinking was so far removed from what it once was. I was just constantly making bad decisions, ignoring my gut instinct, all of the warning signs that I seen telling me not to do this drive and go ahead with it. So I've ended up going through with the driving uh, detail and I've gone to collect a shipment of drugs, but I've ended up walking into a full-blown surveillance operation and I was caught, I was arrested. Now, that feeling of the blue lights in the rear view mirror being arrested is something that will live with me forever. And I still get butterflies to this day seeing the blue lights behind me because it's that feeling of knowing you're now about to embark on a new path, pain, misery, suffering, drag everybody else along with you and also there's no way out and I've only got myself to blame. You then processed with phone in the cells. Now you get offered a phone call and I needed to phone my dad. He's the one person that ever an emergency or a situation, I go to him. My dad's answered and I've gone, dad, it's me, I'm in the police station. I've been arrested, I need help. My dad straight away, what is it son? Is it fighting, are you okay? I've gone, no dad, it's drugs. My dad put the phone down. Now I'm stood with the phone in my hand with the dial tone and I knew how disappointed he was and how much I'd let him down. I think that moment of him hanging up and me stood there with the phone in my hand, both of our worlds were crushed because we were about to now go through something that was just never expected. So I've now gone back to my cell and just head in my hands, just, just thinking, what have I done? I've gone to HMP Winston Green. I spent three and a half months there on remand, which was the most dark, toxic, volatile place you can imagine. My family now has been dragged into this mess. It was one where I was stressed, I was depressed, I was unhealthy, and every night was just eating myself up with the decisions I'd made. But I got bail on February the 14th, Valentine's Day. Now, I was on tag for eight months. So this eight months now, it gave me a chance to completely shift my mindset. I got back into training. I started to get fit. I started to get healthy, knowing that when I go through the trial this time, the next time I go down the stairs will be completely different. We've gone through a five week trial. At the end of the trial, I got 10 years. My girlfriend at the time got seven years. But this time when we have gone down the stairs, as much as there was anger for her getting the seven, it was a relief because 
the what ifs, the waiting was over. We now had a sentence, we had an end date. We could now get on with it and hopefully get through the sentence and then put this behind us. Prison the first time was extremely challenging, extremely tough, totally alien, totally new. The second time I've gone in, because I've had the taste of it the first time, I know what to expect. I'm more prepared. My mindset is more, I'd say, equipped to handle it because I'm going to go in there now. I'm going to stay positive. I'm going to stay focused, keep my head down, keep myself to myself. I want to do my courses because I, I know I need to new, find a new path, a new purpose. But prison's one of them places where you can go in and it can just swallow you up. You can go down the other route of being unhealthy, taking drugs, and it can be a breeding ground for criminal activity, for networking, to come out and do more of the same. Or you can go in there and try and help yourself grow, re-establish yourself. And that's what I did. I was stripped bare of everything and I knew I'd have to build myself back up and I'd find a new way. And I used prison as that tool just to help me find out what made me happy and the direction I wanted to take. For me personally, I had to break it down into stages. So rather than thinking I've got five years and to think of the end date, I'd always try and break it down to like, right, I've got 12 months here and then I'm going to go to my CCAT or I've got six months here, I'll do this course. I always try to break it down in stages. Not trying to think too far ahead because if you start in the beginning thinking, wow, I've got five years, I've got five Christmases, it can really, really be done and really get you down. You are counting down the days, the weeks and the months to freedom and you build it up in your head. For me personally, I did try to shut it out, but it was always there. Now, as time gets closer to the release date, you get a little bit excited. You start making your plans. I used to write things down and things I wanted to achieve, goals I wanted to achieve when I was released. And I knew that when the doors open and you finally let out of jail, it will be a fresh start and a new beginning. So I remember leaving prison, had 40 pounds to my name. Here I was, had to rebuild my life all over again from scratch, find a new career, a new path, and also try and put the mistake that I'd made and all the stigma that come with it behind me. Now going for jobs, I knew it was gonna hold me back and it would always be like the elephant in the room or something that I'd have to discuss. So for me, becoming a personal trainer meant that I could be self-employed, I could be my own boss. I wouldn't have to answer to other people as in a sense of explain my situation. So I was fortunate enough to work in a gym for somebody that I knew, one of my friends. They'd open a brand new gym, they knew my background, they knew what had happened, and they employed me straight away. So I literally just went down that path and I was quite fortunate in that respect. So when I got out, I'd never took a class or a client before. And for me, it was a new challenge. It was a new venture. I was excited. Bear in mind, I've spent five years in a prison with guys in the gym, day in, day out training. Now I was in a civilian gym with new people. I could pass on my knowledge now as a trainer. I could get excited about planning classes, taking circuits. So when I started in the gym, I wanted to establish my own niche. And being an ex-Marine, I wanted to make my training tough, challenging, and also make people step out of their comfort zone. And all of a sudden, lockdown hit. Now, lockdown, I'm sure we've all got our own stories. It was extremely challenging and it was a tough time. But for me personally, having just been in prison all of that time, to now go into a lockdown where I can still come and go out my door, I can eat what I want, I can speak to who I want, I can train whenever I want. The weather was amazing. Now, I got busy, I started training every day. I knew that everything I'd been through from my challenges and my experiences, I knew how much fitness had helped me and I knew how much it helped me stay physically and mentally strong. So I knew when lockdown hit, I could help people do the same. So I've got busy, got doing lives on Instagram, taking circuits, taking workouts, showing people that there was another way that we could still stay fit, active and healthy without the gym. Then I became Commando Charlie. So I wanted to develop a brand, make it a thing, establish my own niche through the workouts and also mental and physical resilience. I now take hiking adventures every month where I build up this amazing fitness community. We get out on the hills, we get in the cold water, we do overnight camps, and we just step out of our comfort zones. We come together, like-minded people, and we really help build each other up and experience everything that nature has to offer. So fitness to me, it's my medicine, it's a therapy. It's helped me overcome some of the most challenging times throughout my life, and now it's gives me structure, it gives me routine, and it helps me stay disciplined. Like life is tough and we all make mistakes, obviously some bigger than others, but we all experience setbacks, challenges or failures. We will make mistakes, but it's how we come back from them that truly matters.